So today we're going to continue our discussion of thermodynamics and talk about enthalpy and calorimetry. So let's talk about enthalpy first. The symbol for enthalpy is a capital H, and enthalpy is a state function, which means it does not depend on the pathway. Usually we're looking at change in enthalpy, so beginning and final. So change in enthalpy is equal to the enthalpy of all the products minus the enthalpy of all the reactants. Enthalpy is also equal to the energy flow as heat at a constant pressure. And so we can say that delta H is equal to Q sub P, so heat at constant pressure. If the change in enthalpy is greater than zero, that means that the reaction is endothermic, which means heat is absorbed by the system or taken in. If delta H is below zero or negative, then we would say that it is exothermic because heat is given off by the system. So let's take a look at an example. So when solid sodium hydroxide pellets are added to water, the following reaction takes place. So we have NaOH solid going to NaOH aqueous. Okay, for this reaction at a constant pressure, the delta H is negative 43 kilojoules per mole. And we want to um, know what happens when we add 14 grams of NaOH to water. So first of all, does the beaker get warmer or colder? Is the reaction exo or endothermic? And what is the enthalpy change for the dissolution? So let's calculate the enthalpy change. So let's see, we'll start up here. So we have our NaOH solid going to our NaOH aqueous. And we know that the delta H of this reaction is equal to negative 43 kilojoules per mole. We also know that we're adding 14 grams of solid NaOH and dissolving it in water. Okay, so the first thing we need is the enthalpy change. Well, we know that for um, every 43 kilojoules that's given off because it's negative, so this tells us that it's exothermic, so that means that the solution is giving off energy. So our beaker then should probably get warmer because the energy is being, being given off to the surroundings and the beaker is part of those surroundings. So, oh, there we go. Okay, so our beaker is warmer. So is the reaction exo or endothermic? Well, because the delta H is negative, that makes it an exothermic reaction. Okay, so now we can answer the third part, which is about enthalpy change. Well, we want to know this is the negative 43 kilojoules per mole. But we want to know, well, how much heat is given off when we have 14 grams of NaOH? Okay, so 14 grams of NaOH, if we want to go to moles, we know we need molar mass. So for every one mole of NaOH, we need the mass. Well, all it did was add up the atomic masses, and that gave me approximately 40. All right, and now I know that according to this balanced chemical equation, for every one mole of NaOH solid that is dissolved, I'm going to produce negative 43 kilojoules. And so because it's already one, I know for every one mole of NaOH in my reaction, it's negative 43 kilojoules. Now, if there was a 2 up here, then that would change our ratio down at the bottom. Okay, so if we calculate this, I've already done it for you, should get negative 15.05 kilojoules. Now if we take a look, we want uh, significant figures, and it looks like 2, and so our answer is negative 15 kilojoules. So even though for the reaction it's negative 43, that's per mole, for 14 grams, 15 kilojoules would be given off. Okay, let's look at the second part, which is calorimetry. So calorimetry is an experimental technique, and it's used to determine the heat exchange, or Q, associated with a reaction. So sometimes we have to do this experimentally. So at a constant pressure, Q is equal to delta H. And we are going to do this um, lab. You can actually do it with a styrofoam coffee cup, because it retains the heat of the reaction inside, and then you can measure the change in temperature. At a constant temperature, Q would be equal to delta E. And then from this, we can determine heat gain or loss. And the amount of heat exchange is going to depend on a couple of factors. First is the net temperature change. Uh, the second is the amount of substance. How much do you have to heat up? And the third is the heat capacity of that substance. 
things, different substances, take different amounts of heat to increase their temperature. Okay, so let's look at that heat capacity. We're going to use a capital C as our variable. And so heat capacity is equal to the heat absorbed divided by the increase in temperature. And so this gives us units of joules per degree Celsius. There are three ways to express heat capacity. They basically mean the same thing. Their units are just a little different. In general, our heat capacity we said was joules per degree C. We also have specific heat capacity, which is the heat capacity per grams. We could have joules per gram degree Celsius or joules per gram Kelvin, depending on what units your temperature is in. And then we can also have molar heat capacity, which is the heat capacity per mole of substance. So instead of joules per gram degree Celsius, we have joules per mole degree Celsius or joules per mole Kelvin. So just depending on your temperature. And we can use dimensional analysis to solve these calorimetry problems. So we're kind of just going to use our units. Uh, there's also an equation that exists, which is Q equals MC delta T. Don't get married to that equation because it can change depending on units. And so that's why we rely on dimensional analysis. But this is also a helpful tool. Okay, let's look at another example. So which conducts heat better, water or aluminum, and why is this important for cooking? All right, so there are tables in many books that list heat capacities for lots of different substances. So we've looked up the heat capacity for water and for aluminum. Okay, and they are right here. And if you notice, aluminum's heat capacity is much less. So what this means is that it takes much less energy to heat one gram by one degree Celsius. For water, it takes 4.18 joules to heat one gram by one degree Celsius. So aluminum takes less heat to heat up. This could be really important for cooking because think about, you know, a lot of your pans are aluminum or some sort of metal substance, which generally has a lower heat capacity. And so they'll heat up faster, thus transferring the heat to the food or whatever you're trying to heat up. Okay, so let's look at some calorimetry problems. We're going to look at one with constant pressure and then one with constant um, volume. I think volume. Yep. Okay, so constant pressure. So we've got one liter of one molar barium nitrate at 25 is mixed with one liter of one molar sodium sulfate at 25 in a calorimeter. Okay, so we're mixing these two things together. And then we form a white solid of barium sulfate. And the temperature of the mixture goes up from 25 to 28.1. So they're giving us the heat capacity, the density of the solution, and we want to find the enthalpy change per mole, or basically we're solving for the heat. That's supposed to be Q. Heat per mole. All right, well, let's write our equation first. We know we've got barium nitrate plus sodium sulfate. And let's see, we're forming solid barium sulfate. So then our other product must be sodium nitrate. And we know anything mixed with the nitrate is aqueous. Let's balance it real quick. I need a two in front of my sodium, and that looks good. So now I know I have one liter, one molar. It's at 25 Celsius. Same thing for the sodium sulfate. I know for the barium sulfate, um, let's see, the temperature went up to 28.1 degrees C. I also have my heat capacity at 4.18 joules per gram degrees Celsius. And the density of my overall solution, so I'm just going to put it on this side, is 1 gram per milliliter. So I'm looking for heat per mole. Well, let's look at those in two separate parts. So this is where the dimensional analysis comes in. I know Q is equal to M C delta T. And so I need mass, I need heat capacity, and I need change in temperature. Well, I know that because I added one liter of each of my reactants that my total solution volume is two liters. I also know the density of my solution. So I can take, let's go up to the top here, I can take my two liters of solution uh, because my density is in grams per milliliter, I need to get my liters to milliliters. So for every one liter, I know there's a thousand milliliters. And the density is one, so I know for every one milliliter, that's one gram. So basically, this comes to 2,000 grams. So that's my mass. 
My heat capacity is 4.18 joules per gram degrees C. And my delta T is final minus initial, so 28.1 degrees Celsius minus 25 degrees Celsius. I've done this for you already. It should come out to 25,916. So we've got 25,916. Now let's look at our units. Degree C on top and bottom, grams on top and bottom, so I'm left with joules. Let's do significant figures at the end. Um, so now we need to find moles. Well, I know that I have information on both reactants, and they're all one to one to one from both my reactants to my barium sulfate. So if I can find the moles of each of these and determine the limiting reactant, I'll know the moles of the barium sulfate. Well, let's go back up to the top for a sec. Where is my pen? Okay, we know that molarity is equal to moles per liter. So if I want moles, that's equal to molarity times liters. Well, if I go back down, barium nitrate, 1 times 1 is 1. Sodium sulfate, 1 times 1 is 1. So these are all 1 mole, so there really is no one limiting reactant. And because they're all 1 to 1 to 1, that means that I have 1 mole of barium sulfate. So anything divided by 1 is just itself per mole. And now let's do significant figures. So if I take a look, I see, except for the density, which is kind of a given, I see 3 everywhere. So I'm going to say 25,900 joules per mole. And there you go. Okay, let's look at one more. So here we've got a constant volume. So we have a bomb calorimeter. Now, we talked about the styrofoam cup calorimeter. A bomb calorimeter is just a fancier one. It's all encased. Kind of looks like a bomb. Um, you can ignite your substance from the outside so that all that temperature change is purely accurate. Um, is accurately recorded. And so it's just a fancier calorimeter. Okay, so it's got a heat capacity of 11.3 kilojoules per degree Celsius. We've got a 1.5, so let's see, whoops. So um, we'll do this at the top. So C is equal to 11.3 kilojoules per degree C. We have a methane sample of 1.50 grams, and its increase in temperature, so it's delta T, is 7.3 degrees Celsius. Um, we also have a substance of hydrogen gas, and it's burned, so its mass is 1.15 grams, and its increase in temperature, or its change in temperature, is 14.3 degrees C. Okay, so we want to know the energy of combustion per gram for each of these. So we are looking for joules per gram. All right, so, um, well, maybe not joules, because if you look at our heat capacity, it's in kilojoules. It just says energy, so I guess kilojoules would be totally fine. It's not really saying either way. Okay, so we need kilojoules. Well, I know that this is kilojoules per degree C. Well, I know I have a change in temperature right here. If I multiply those together, that will give me kilojoules. So let's do methane first for our top part, our kilojoules. We're going to take 11.3 kilojoules per degree Celsius. I'm going to multiply it by the temperature change for the methane, which was 7.3 degrees C. I've done this already. It comes out to 82.49 kilojoules. Okay, well, you're going to do the same thing for H2. Same calorimeter, so same heat capacity. Different change in temperature, however. And so if you multiply those together, we get 161.59 kilojoules. Now, we want kilojoules per gram. Well, I know that I put in the bomb calorimeter 1.50 grams of methane. So if I divide those, I'm going to get 54.993 kilojoules per gram. Let's do significant figures while we're here. It looks to me we've got 7.3, so let's go with 2. So we've got 55 kilojoules per gram. Now let's do the same thing for the hydrogen. I know my mass for hydrogen was 1.15 grams. So if I divide these, it gives me 140.5. Two significant figures makes it 140 kilojoules per gram.